Jesus. In Latin, it's Asus Secuti Asus is what is how, how you pronounce that. I thought that would just be cool to put it in there in Latin. That just kind of makes it fun, right? You and I need to understand something about where we are right now. We are in transition. This church is in a transition. And, and when I looked up this word transition, uh, Marion Webster says this is the process or a period of changing from one state or condition into another. That's where we are. That's what's going on. You and I are in transition. Transition of the church. So what is the church? Uh, the dictionary says it's a body of religious believers. Oh, that's one definition. But the Hebrew definition is that it's a legislative assembly called the ecclesia. That's who we are. It's a different thing. It's a di there are a lot of bodies of believers out there, bodies of religious people out there. They call them the church. But the real church, according to Jesus, according to the Hebrew language, is the ecclesia. We are a legislative body with the authority and power from heaven to actually legislate 
what's coming and what happens next and who stands and who doesn't stand according to the demonic entities that we face. Amen? There's a power that we have that we haven't practiced using because we lack anointing. We simply lack anointing. And, and this, is, this is so exciting to, to get this. Listen, my wife and I were talking this morning about when, when, the, when the, the time comes where the Lord begins to openly manifest his glory and radical healings begin to take place in this place. That's what's fixing to happen. We know that. And, and we talked about that. Why is everybody on standby? Everybody's kind of waiting Except Bill and his class. They're not waiting on anybody. But the point is, is that you and I think based on our last disappointment. Are you with me? Amen. Let me give you an example. All the different things I've been through in the last couple of years, dealing with the shift and the change and all that, that's all exciting. It's all good. It's all part of growth. And, and here in the last few months my right shoulder has been getting worse and worse and worse and 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 then somebody says well that's cause you're 61 no that's a lie from the devil I don't have nothing to do with the price eggs right I don't care about that you know I bet on Noah 500 years old he can still do this right <laughs> see, see and so so I went to get a shot in it because Julius used to just give me a you know he was my hookup buddy right I go get a shot in my shoulder, and here we go another six months. Well, I went to the guy that replaced him, and he wouldn't do it. He said, you need to go get an MRI. So I went and got an MRI. Well, I actually have a tear in my rotator cuff that went all the way through. That's why the most painful part of my day is trying to blow dry my hair. But it only takes about 60 seconds, so that's not too bad. <laughs> so I don't have that much hair anymore. Amen. But the point is, is that I've been taking communion. I've been cursing this thing for weeks. Listen to me. I've been cursing this thing for weeks, commanding this thing to be healed, and it's not healed yet. And you want me to pray for you? I'm serious. Think about this. Now, Bill's class will teach you the real stuff. He'll teach you how to think so that when you do step in, you're ready. But you and I as a group, everybody that didn't go to Bill's class, raise your hand. Just so you know, after service, you can sign up right back there and start it, a new class coming up. But the point is that you and I operate and think like our last disappointment without really understanding some of the process behind it. We give up before it's time to give up. It says these signs will follow them and believe they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Recover means there's a process. 90% of the healings that Jesus did, he made them get involved. Like rise up, pick up your bed, or go wash. Or he, he made them actively do something they couldn't do before to engage the faith and bring in the healing. See what I'm saying? There's something to that. They may not all be immediate. It may, it may be an hour or two or a day or two. It, I don't know. He's the healer, amen? amen? But we give up way too fast. Come on. Well, you prayed for me during church. Well, I'm going back home now. <laughs> Nothing happened. It still hurts. Are, are you with me? It's a mindset. We, we got to get going. We'll be here all day. I got to hurry. But you got to catch this. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter means Petros, or small pebbles. And he said upon this rock, meaning Petra, or, or Gibraltar himself, he'll build the ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, for years, I didn't really understand that gates of hell statement. If the gates of hell will not prevail against us, then you going to hell? Are you going to shake the gates? What, what, that, what does that mean? What are the gates of hell? I'll give you a couple of examples. We live here on earth, right? There are altars 
that are being built all around us that connect hell to the surface. Are you with me? Here's what these gates look like. They're abortion clinics. They're liquor stores. They're smoke shops open 24 hours a day. Drug houses, maybe one near you. Strip clubs, pornography outlets. How about this? False, ungodly religious churches with a form of godliness but deny the power thereof and they're leading people away from God, not to God. Are you with me? Any area or source of demonic influence that is aided by or permitted by a human to interact in this world are considered evil altars. We're gonna, I'm going to do a series about altars coming up. We're also going to learn about righteous altars. But these are the gates of hell, and, and Jesus said they will not prevail against the church as long as you know who you are. You know what you have. You know what he's given you. You act like he act. You speak like he spoke. You do what he did. They won't prevail. But if you back up and, and, and curl up in the corner, they're just going to go rampant. Are you with me? Woo. We're going to get a step up and a spanking all over again today. All together. Amen. To be like Jesus, John 14 and 12, Jesus said, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Jesus said it's going to happen. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. He's won the battle. He's paid the price. He, he, get, he got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And whosoever, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's a pretty strong statement. But we don't really believe that part. Because we don't do the first part. If the first part happens, then we'll believe the last part. Matthew 10 and 1, Jesus called the 12 disciples and he gave them power to, to, against all unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all manner of disease and all manner of sickness. All manner. He gave them power to do that. Luke chapter 10 verse 1, he also appointed 70 other disciples, sent them out two by two. You skip down to verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us by your name. They were excited about the new power they found that Jesus gave them. Luke 10 and 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He was there. He saw it take place. And he says, behold, I give unto you, everybody look at your neighbor and say, you, power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you notwithstanding in this rejoice not that's not the best deal that's not the most exciting thing for you to celebrate the most exciting thing is that 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 you and I our names are written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven that's the big news that's the good news what does it require for us to have this power from Jesus to be able to accomplish what the Word clearly says that we will do? Jesus fully intends for us to operate in a level of anointing that is over all the power of the enemy. He wants us to destroy the works of Satan just like he did when he was here. He paid the price on the whipping post and on the cross for his sons and his daughters to do exactly what he prophesied that we would do. No exceptions. Mark 16 and 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believe on me and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It's pretty obvious. And, it, and he talks about these signs will follow them that believe. We've talked about that. So what is the gospel? What is he talking about? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? I guarantee you, if I passed out a paper and pen to everybody, we'd have 32 different descriptions of the gospel. Let me tell you what my favorite 
description is. Are you ready? To me, the gospel is the good news that you don't have to be lost. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be broken. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to carry disease. You don't have to be overcome with maladies or trauma. The kingdom of God is here and now the good news is the bad news is wrong. Are you with me? That's the gospel. Tell the people the good news, the bad news is wrong. How can this possibly happen? Luke 24 and 49, Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power. That's what we're missing. We're missing the power. Tarry in Jerusalem until you're endowed with power from on high. Power. Power. The Holy Ghost. Power. Dunamis. We get the word dynamite from that. Power. The power to cast out demons. The power to, ca- to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. The power to... To, to legislate, the power to command and, and be over all the power of the enemy. See, see, listen, if you had all that power, you'd have a different attitude. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The closer we get, the more disturbed I get. The closer we get to walking in a measure of anointing to cast out all demons and heal all this manner of sickness and all manner of disease, the more I hear about sickness, the more angry I get. Patricia King's going to be here in two weeks, and her husband's been dealing with Parkinson's. It's a, it's a horrible thing that's attacked him and attacked his body. Why does he have to have that? He doesn't. He can walk into this place, and God can heal him right here on this carpet. Somebody has to stand up and say, that's enough. I'm going to go where God's invited me to go. But there are things that are stopping you. Things that have stopped us for years. That's going to be next week. You don't want to miss that. But the powerful reality is the Holy Ghost is just the beginning. We were always taught that's the ultimate thing. That's the ultimate. No, no, that's the penultimate thing. Because once you get the Holy Ghost, you start building the power. You start building the layers of anointing. You've got to start with the Holy Ghost. You've got to be filled with the Spirit of God. Then you get into spiritual gifts. Then you get into the anointing. Then you get into, are you with me? And many of us thought, well, that, man, I got the Holy Ghost when I was 13. I got baptized at the youth camp and I spoke in tongues and that was 37 years ago. That's why you're as powerless as an old D battery sitting out in the back of the garage. Are you with me? How many agree with that? You have to cultivate the relationship. You have to go back to that place. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place when I first believed and I first received. Have another encounter. You need an encounter with God. You need to encounter with the Holy Ghost. You need to be refilled, refreshed, and get on the road to the new levels of glory to glory to glory. Walk in obedience, and the Lord will lead you to a place. You know why? Because he is waiting for you and me to get it. He's waiting for us to wake up and become who he paid for us to be with his own blood. My goodness. If you're a demon, this is not going to be a good place for you very long. (laughs) Does it seem to you that very few people have the power over all the power of the enemy? You could probably write down four or five names and in your heart you believe those five people have what the Bible's talking about. When it was the intention of the Lord to give everybody in this one category that power. And it was the category in Mark 16 where he said, all believers. These signs will follow them that believe. He intended for all of us to carry it. That's why we're so far behind. 
But let me encourage you. We're about to catch up fast. Matter of fact, the Lord can, he can, he can rebuild and redo stuff. He can, he can bring back things. He can make up time faster than anybody because he's not limited to time. See, back in Nehemiah's day, and they, they got the power and the, the passion to restore the walls in Jerusalem. 34 different families took that opportunity in 52 days. They rebuilt what was torn down for 70 years. Lord's fixing to spin this place like a top. <laughs> Asa say, ku tiesus, to be like Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to be like Jesus. <laughs> Hebrews says, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The anointing comes in stages and in levels, from glory to glory, from level to level, from authority to authority. Now, I'm going I'm to show you a couple of books that I've read in the last few months. Some of these books come from the school of Kingdom University that, that we have. And this first one I want to show you, I believe that you should set aside some money to feed you. I think you should set aside some money that, that, that puts your evil twin at bay and lets your spirit man grow a little bit. Quit, quit buying $30 pizzas and buy a couple of these $12 books. It'll change your whole life. Are you all right? ready? This first book is Unlimited Anointing. Dennis Goldworthy Davis. I, I have this book. I've got marks all over it. I've got tabs sticking out of it, and I can't find it anywhere. I was going to use it to put some of the notes in here. I'll look for it next week. This book is powerful. It's very small. He, he writes really small books, and they're awesome. That, that way you don't get lost in some big theological thing and quit reading. These are small enough just to hook you, and you can finish this thing in like four hours. The next book is another book that he wrote, There Must Be More. This is the crying passion of the heart when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You've heard about it. The Lord's promised it to you, and you're tired of not having it. I'm sick of that. If I had all the money back I've given a doctor in the last 10 years, I could buy a boat. A nice boat. Paid for. I want my boat back. Next book is this. Face to Face. There's two books coming up. This one is the, the first book. Tony Kemp, my wife and I were privileged to meet him and take him out to, to eat a couple of times. And he's had encounters that took him to heaven he went one night the lord came and an angel took him to heaven for like four hours he came back and that whole encounter brought revelation knowledge uh, anointing authority he's having services Pe metal comes out of people's uh, arms grow out all sorts of miracles take place because he was in the presence of jesus and got it and the Lord let him have that encounter so he could come back and write these books. That's volume one. There's a volume two. I just finished that one. I read that one this week. And these encounters tell you it's for us. But, but there has to be a consecration. This morning we were talking about commitment. De Deborah was talking about com commitment, the, the word the Lord keeps speaking to her. You and I have to have some consecration. And, and it shouldn't be that hard. We are designed to have passion. We are people that are designed to have passion. And, and I can prove it to you. There, there's a few things in your life that you've had passion about. And, and you locked in on that thing. And you pursued it so hard you were just stupid. Remember that? Are, are you with me? It's like... It's like Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this like, a, like an athlete. Paul talks about being an athlete where you put your mind and focus on something and you go for the prize and you don't stop until you get there and you achieve that thing. Amen. Consecration is like that. God wants to see consecration out of us. He wants to see us so hungry and so interested and so passionate. We, we go over the top in pursuit of him. Amen. He wants us to hunger for him. And he's going he's to greatly reward us for that. 
Matthew 6 and 6 tells us that if, if he sees us in the secret place, he don't even have to hear us. But if he sees us there, he's going to reward us openly. Why? Because he's going to give you the desires of your heart for being passionate about him and what he wants. It's time for that. And see, here, here's, the, here's the bad American attitude. This, this messes so many people up. It's like, well, I'll just hang out and let you get it. Then I'll get in your prayer line and I'll be healed and everybody's happy. You pay all the price you carry around the anointing, I'll just get in the prayer line. Right? Really? Is that good enough? Are you going to be a spiritual beggar all your life? What are you going to tell Jesus when you stand in front of him and go, Oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I was just too lazy to pray. <laughs> I didn't have to read because Pastor Davis went nuts on us up there all the time, every Sunday. I didn't have to read. You see what I'm saying? See, see, the Lord intends for you to have this because there's people in your sphere of influence I'm never going to meet. They're not coming to church. They don't like church. They don't. They don't trust church. But they trust you. And the Lord's intention is for you to take the gospel to the streets. Not bring them into the, into the house. Oh, we're going to grow. Don't worry about that. that. People start getting healed. You'll get here Sunday and your seat will be taken. I ain't worried about that. But you need to have the anointing. And then another layer. And then another layer. Think about David for a minute. There he was, a teenager, probably 13 years old, out there on the side of the hillside, herding sheep, playing his harp, worshiping God. And he calls, and there, there, there the old prophet was, bring him in here, poured that oil over his head, anointed him at 13 years old. That was the first wave of anointing. Poof, right there. There was enough anointing in that moment to take out Goliath. <laughs> Are you with me? Changed the whole spectrum of the nation in that one anointing. Then he was anointed king of Hebron. Right? Then he was anointed king of Israel. See what I'm saying? Layer after layer after layer. You and I have the option to be anointed by things we hear, being in the Word of God, songs that we hear, being in services. How many times have you been prayed for? How many times have you had oil put on your head or something and been prayed for and an anointing been released over you? You can't have narrow vision. You have to look at it for what it is. See, see the anointing of God's not like a popsicle. It's not going to be there for a minute and gone when it gets hot. Are you with me? It's not like that. The anointing will be there. The residue is there and it builds and builds and builds. That's what we've been missing is the honest expectation of knowing and understanding. Hey, Benny Hinn can do it. I can do it. Yeah. Hebrews says Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's no respecter of person. Right? Isn't that right, Bill? Bill teach you this stuff. You need to sign up for that class. Romans 2 and 11. There is no respect of persons with God. If they can have it, I'm going to have it. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to have it. Say what you want. Act how you want, but don't get in my way. So the foundation, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. 
For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death. That's what most of us have carried around for years. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is at enmity with God, against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then if they are in the flesh, they cannot please God. Because Jesus intends for all of us to operate in the same anointings he did. He paid the price. He's just waiting for you to step in. Be consecrated enough to start growing in that direction. Every one of us, not just the preacher, not just the fivefold ministry, not just teachers, not just people with a name tag, but everyone that is a believer. Is there any believers in the house? Raise your hand. Then he's talking about us. But if you're, if you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so, be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. In other words, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't belong to Jesus. Because it is the spirit of Jesus. He said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come again. How's he going to come again in the form of the Holy Ghost? He's in you. He fills you. If Christ be in you, catching this? If Christ be in you through the form of the Holy Ghost, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. In verse 11, here's the one you need to highlight. <laughs> Excuse me. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwelleth in you. That's what you need. That's what we're missing. If that spirit is in you and you're in that situation where you need to lay hands on that person and they're blind and they need to see, that spirit in you is going to quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwells in you, and he's going to heal them just like he did when he was here. Does that make sense? I know, man, this is like way over somebody. Everybody go, whoo, 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 way over our head because we've never were taught this stuff. Huh? It's not your fault, but now you're responsible. Now you've got to do something about it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you'll live. That's what I'm talking about, consecration. You have to be more passionate for the anointing and the power that Jesus paid for than you do pampering your own flesh. That's it. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to die to the flesh, take up your cross, and follow me. That means do what he did. Think like he think. Act like he acted. Speak like he spoke. Engage in the miracles he engaged in. I'm telling you, folks, this is going to be incredible. This, this sonic boom in this church isn't going to be about one person. It's going to be about a whole group of the ecclesia that gets it, walks in it, lives it. Things are going to explode all over the town, and nobody's going to be able to put their finger on anything except Jesus. That's what's about to happen. For as many as they're led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, sons and daughters. That, that, that word means both. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Stop fearing because yesterday was a failure. Don't stop moving forward doing what Jesus did just because the last person you prayed for died the next day. I'm serious. Satan will mess with your head. You, you know why I'm so passionate now? You know why I'm so committed? Why I'm so tenacious? I feel like Caleb, vigorous old dog. I'm getting my mountain. I'm just as strong now as I was back then. I'm 61 and I got a bad attitude. I am. Listen, things change when you turn 60. You can wear shorts and high socks and, and go, to the, go to the mall. 
<laughs> I didn't say I was going to. I just said you could. <laughs> I'd be picked up for indecent exposure. <laughs> the reason I'm so passionate is I have nothing to lose except pain and failure. Nothing to lose and everything to gain. I'm going for it. I don't care what I sound like. I don't care what I look like. I'm going to do it the way Jesus said do it. And I'm going to walk in the place he said I could walk. I'm going to have everything he said I could have. I'm going to do what he says I can do. And I'm going to give him all the glory and all the praise for it. And we're going to keep doing it. And, and you know what? I, I, may be like the, the, I may be like the David in the crowd. But if you remember the story of David and Goliath, as soon as he dropped Goliath, everybody went after his four brothers and killed them. Are you with me? See, until the four-minute mile was broken, nobody could do it. Until one day, somebody broke the four-minute mile. The next year, three more athletes broke the four-minute mile. Why? Because they saw somebody can do it. Listen, friend. Jesus said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. Everybody goes, oh, boy, you choked me on that third one. He did. He messed up every funeral he attended. <laughs> Didn't he? He did. He did. But in our case, I think it's the spiritually dead we're going to have to raise to get started. Right? Amen? <laughs> Here we go. Don't get mad at me. I didn't make you lazy. Here we go. Here we go. 16, the Spirit itself bears witness in our spirit that we are children of God. When we start moving in that capacity, we start feeling the anointing inside of us. We feel that desire and that sensitivity to do those things. Jesus had compassion. He said, I only do what I see my Father do. He saw it in the Spirit. He knows when it's time to do what He did, and He did that. He didn't heal everybody in Israel, but He healed everybody that came to Him. Do you realize that? There wasn't a single person he turned away and said, oh, no, you don't have enough faith. Oh, no, you don't, you don't live a certain way. You don't, oh, no, you're not a member of the church. Oh, you didn't get baptized. I'm not healing you. He didn't do that. He healed them and loved them. Then they'll talk about your religion. If children, then heirs. See, if we're, if we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so, to be that we suffer with him, then we may also glorify together, be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And it's not talking about heaven. It's talking about here. The glory is going to be revealed in us because Jesus is in us. Are you, are you getting this? For the earnest expectation of the creature, this creature, this word creature, it means tisis. It means creation. The earnest expectation of everything around you is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Everything is waiting on us to get it. That's when greater things than he did shall be done. Because instead of one person out doing it, instead of 12 people out doing it, we're going to have 300 people going nuts across this town doing it. Are you with me? That's exciting. And, and I'll tell you something else. Your children will start doing it before you do if you let them. You know why? Because they don't have to be retrained. They don't have to be reprogrammed. Everybody needs to go home today and, and, and hook up to your spiritual cable and go control, alt, delete. You need, a, you need a hard drive reboot. Christ, the anointed one, joint heirs, the same power and potential. That's what it means to be joint heirs. Fullness that inhabited him, fullness that can be in us, then all things are possible. All because of what Jesus did for us. That's why John 14 and 12, that's why he said that he that believes on me, these works will he do. 
So the anointing comes in levels. Listen, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says this. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. These are elemental, structured tutors to help us come, become perfect. Perfect simply means mature. So, so when it's time for this, that is there. When it's time for this, that is there. The Lord will expose us to the right teaching and training because we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. You and I live in a day that, that we, don't have to, we don't have to be 25 miles from town on horseback. Listen, if you need something, you can get on YouTube and the Lord will connect you with something, blow your mind. We live in a place and a time where we have instant access to things. There's no reason why we shouldn't be mature. For the perfecting and maturing, this is why those fivefold ministries exist. For the perfecting or maturing of the saints, for the works of the ministry, number two, and the edifying of the body of Christ, number three. That's the reason they exist. Till we all come into the unity of faith, listen to this, the unity of faith, meaning we all understand unity means you put your way on the table. Oh, well, Pastor, we never did it like that. That's why you never did it. The unity of the faith. What is the faith? What does that word faith mean? Pistis, it means our complete and total commitment to the fact that Jesus is the reason for salvation. Nothing else. No, no, nothing else. You don't, get, you, don't, you don't get to have any glory. It's not yours. It's his. It's all his. Until we come into the measure, listen to this, the measure, uh, let me reread the whole thing. Till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man, meaning co collectively, corporately, unto, listen to this, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, right now, we have the measure of, of the stature of a baby in Christ. <laughs> are you with me? There are other levels. There are other anointings you're missing. The Lord has a plan for you. And if you pray, if you fast, if you give, if you do the things he said in Matthew chapter 6, your ways are going to be led by the Spirit of God. He'll lead you. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Holy Ghost. And he'll lead you to your next divine encounter with the anointing you're supposed to have next. See, what, what, what my wife and I have been doing, I thought about this. I haven't made my list yet, but I'm going to make a list. I remember when I was nine years old, I went to a... a, a Revival in the Assembly of God Church, and I sit on the front row, right there where Earl is sitting. And this visiting minister was over here on this side on a piano. He was singing and playing, and he got up and he began to preach. And, and I had my little Bible out, and I was sitting there by myself. And he stopped right in the middle of his sermon. He goes, "Young man, God's calling you to be a pastor one day." Nine years old. He said, "I'm going to pray for you." And there's going to be an anointing that comes on you. I was like, cool, man. Let's do this. When I was 12, it happened in Wichita Falls at a tent revival. Th these different times when the Lord sends somebody to, to pray for you and anointing transfers. Listen, it could have been your mom. It could have been your grandmother. It could have been your neighbor. It doesn't have to be somebody with some big ministry. It's a carrier of the Holy Ghost. That's all they got to be, a believer that carries the anointing. And the Lord will take that and say, listen, I need you to go pray for that man right there. Go lay hands on him and pray for him. What do I say? I don't, don't worry about what I say. Just, just lay your hands on him. And that transfer takes place. He don't even know what happened yet. When my wife and I were ordained by Kent Brown 20 years ago in Houston... He poured oil over our head like, oh, man, it was like the old priesthood days or something. 
oil dripping off our head. Well, our hair looked terrible that day. You should have seen that. But the anointing that came with it was incredible. And he told us, he said, listen, he said, it's going to take you years to learn how to walk in the anointing the Lord just gave you. And I thought my little arrogant self, I said, oh, no, man, I got this. Let's go. Let's do this. He was right. I'm still learning 20 years later. The point is, is that the Lord has some things planned for you. I don't care where you're at. I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you live. I don't care what your yesterday was. It doesn't really matter if you're a fisherman, a tax collector, a doctor. I don't care what you are. The Lord has a plan. He has people lined up to anoint you to the next level of anointing. And in your study... You're going to be receiving the revelation and knowledge. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is going to come to you, and that revelation is going to take you up a notch, and the anointing is going to be there to use it. Are you with me? Stop thinking you're done. Quit thinking it's over. Quit thinking you missed it. John G. Lake didn't even get started until he was in his 50s. He was a wealthy wealthy real estate man and you know the first thing he did when God called him he hired an attorney and a CPA and got them to help him distribute and get rid of all of his wealth then he started following Jesus listen friends God has a plan that will blow your mind if you'll follow him and stop being driven by your own flesh Amen. Oh, I better say in closing. Now I got five minutes left. In closing, turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. This is one of the most beautiful pictures of anointing. Just a few verses, chapter 47 from verse 2 to verse 6. Then that brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter, utter gate by the way of that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. And the waters were ankle deep. It went to the ankles. Then again he measured a thousand cubits. And brought me through the water. And the waters were to the knees. And again he measured a thousand. And brought me through. And the waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand. And it was... A river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen. It was water to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Today I have a question for you. After what you just heard for the last few minutes, where are you? Where are you? The ankles? The ankles mean that you're satisfied with feeling the anointing and services or maybe when you hear a song on the radio, but you will not go any deeper because at the ankles you are in full control, my friend. That's where some people live. They live their whole life there. What about the knees? There may be some of you that that, that are in the anointing all the way to your knees. The knees are slightly better. You enjoy the feeling of anointing, the intimacy and closeness of God, but you still have a measure of control that you refuse to give over. You're satisfied with this depth because it's deeper than many people around you and you feel justified.
Then there's the loins. This is the place that real hunger begins to reveal itself. (laughs) You're past the lies of the enemy that disqualified you for so long, and your hunger for the ultimate level of the fullness of Jesus is worth more to you now than your past life of achievements ever did. Then finally, waters to swim in. Finally, you have surrendered. Congratulations. You have died to the flesh. You've denied your flesh. You've picked up your cross and you're following Jesus. You have given him full control and have adopted the passion to do the will of the Father at any cost. After all, Matthew 7 and 14, Jesus said, Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. To be like Jesus, Asus Seku Tiesus. Can we stand? I don't know where you are today, but I know one thing. The Lord planned this day to invite you to the next level. If you're ankle deep, he wants you to slip on in to knee deep today. If you're knee deep, he wants you to kind of let go of the rail. Get on out a little bit so you're loin deep, waist deep. Because then you start feeling the pressure of the current. It's not so easy for you to control anymore. You know exactly where he wants to take you because the current's pushing you that way. And today, if that's where you are, he wants you to go three steps deeper till your feet don't touch bottom anymore. And he will take you to places you never dreamed of. But you have to die, my friend. you got to let go of you. So for a few minutes of time, I want to open this front up. Go ahead and crank the music up, Brad. Today, if you're here and you want to go to the next level, don't come up here unless you're serious. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not anointing anybody. I just want you to come and tell Jesus what your plan is. If you want to go deeper, if you're tired of being sick, if you're tired of being powerless, if you're tired of no revelation, If you're tired of being empty, come up and tell Jesus.